My friends over at Roosevelt's, they make the most incredible shirts. And and they they have everything from Disney to The Office to Jurassic Park, WWE, and everything pop culture. Nickelodeon, Nicktoons. My son and I fight over the shirts that we get shipped to us. Use promo code SWOGGLE. Save 20% off any order from button-ups to hoodies to activewear, everything. Guys, go to roosevelts.com. R-S-V-L-T-S dot com. Use promo code SWOGGLE. Save yourself 20% on everything. R-S-V-L-T-S dot com. You're listening to the Major Pod Network, the only place where your favorite toy store, card shop, arcade, theme park, and arena are all on the same block. Scratch that major itch. Guys, welcome to another episode of Going Postal. I'm Dylan. That's George. We're Going Postal. As you saw in the description, this week we're playing uh, a bit of an extended version of the Renee interview from very early in the small talk days. My interview with Renee Young, Renee Pachette, whatever you call her, whatever you know her by, my interview with Renee that's what we're doing on today's episode. But before we go any farther, that's my co-host, George. He's that's my me. riding buddy. He's in charge of it all. George, how are we? Uh, I'm doing well, but it's not just me. You also have a huge part. There is no podcast without you telling stories and sitting down and interviewing everybody. And of course, we got to give a shout out to friend of the show, member of Postal Industries, the man behind the social clips, Mr. Bobby Orlando, aka your mom. That's that's what he goes by. That's not me saying that. That's Bobby's thing. And of course, um, Bobby Jr. We, we love Bobby Jr. And uh, Bobby Orlando think- in charge of the uh, the going postal shorts lately, and just knocking them out of the park. Uh, so what fun. We, Hopefully, he's enjoying it. There, Dylan. It's a video huh? podcast. What are we playing with? <laughs> <laughs> it's a video podcast. What's going on? Yep. Forgot we do video now. <laughs> what are we, what are I have my there? fan hook because I'm I'm a little guy, so every every room has a fan hook, so I can reach my ceiling fans and turn them off and on. Okay. In the other rooms, I don't have a switch, and I had an itch on my knee. <laughs> That's what I thought you were doing. That's what I thought you were doing. <laughs> We've been got, going for like a year. I got now. no segue for that. That's just no. where we are. No, we've been going for a bit, and I forgot uh, that we're a video podcast. You ah! know, it happens. It happens. Um, Before we go listen. any further, guys, uh, we want to make sure to thank our friends over at the Roosevelt's. Head over to rsvlts.com. Use promo code SWOGGLE and save yourself some cash. They just released these brand new breakfast balls, polos, office Happy Gilmore. They got turtles. Everything you want. If you're a golfer, if you just want to be fashionable in a polo, most breathable shirts ever. I still swear by these to this day. Just absolutely awesome, awesome stuff. RSVLTS.com. Use promo code SWOGGLE site wide. And of course, at Going Postal Pod on all forms of social media, at Dylan Postal on all forms of social media. You got the YouTube channel. If you're listening to the audio version of this and you would like to see Dylan's handsome face live and in living color, it's you go to YouTube. It's you myself with a fan slash. stick. <laughs> if you want to see the fan stick that Dylan's interesting himself with, there you go. Uh, YouTube.com slash Dylan Postal. You've got the Twitch streams, twitch.tv slash Dylan Postal. You've got swaggleauction.com. 
Go there, get yourself a free $10 credit on whatnot. And of course, coming soon, we've been teasing it. The gears are in motion. The wheels are spinning. Whatever analogy you want to use, the brand new DylanPostel.com coming soon. The one-stop shop for all things Swaggle. And of course, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Swaggle. For all of Swaggle shirts, it's where the Going Postal podcast shirts are going to live. But that's the plugs. That's the intro. Dylan, are we going over to the interview? Is it We're going right there. To- Pachet. Pachet. It's, it's a, it's a very throaty last name. Um, Renee and I, we became just buddies. I, like, I feel like she does with everyone very quickly. Like, we just became pals. Uh, I saw how JBL and Cole took to her, and it made perfect sense. How, how she's just, as, as people say, just a doll. And this interview was just, it was very early, very early in the small talk series. And uh, I was like, you know what? I really, really want to have her on and get her story of it all and uh, just have some some fun talking to a, a good pal that I ha- hadn't caught up with in forever. All right. Well, with that, away we go. Here we go. Mad Cat Beard Care. They are the absolute best. They make my beard feel soft, silky, smooth. But not only that, they've been a one-man show since 2019. Mad Cat Beard Care uses a portion of sales to care for local stray cats, cover their medical bills, find safe spaces, and forever homes. Their products are made to order with vitamins and all natural oils that promote strong, healthy hair and moisturize your skin as well. Mad Cat Beard Care has exclusive scents for myself as well as other wrestlers such as a childhood favorite of mine, Delirious. Ring of Honor Legend with his lime and French vanilla scent that makes my beard smell and feel amazing. And of course, make sure to try my exclusive scent, Swaggled, with nuts of lavender and sage. And guys, make sure to use promo code Swaggled to save 15% on your whole order at madcatbeardcare.com. And remember, the mad cat makes a happy beard. I even took notes like a real Yay. professional. Like a pro. Yeah. I mean, the the whole note taking process is like an art in and of itself. Oh, I'm horrible at it. I think I'm pretty good at it at this point. I think I'm a good note taker, but I don't use my notes that often. I like write the notes down and then I like kind of internalize it. And then I just hope for the best once. That's literally that. how I am is I use it for, hey, I don't want to forget this thing. Totally. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Guys, we're already into it. This is small talk. Uh, and it's 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 the first. The first of its kind. You know, usually the small talk is between me and, and my people. Um, but this is different. This is a big one. It's a it's it's me looking up in this conversation uh, to a friend, uh, looking up to an interviewer, looking up to a woman that changed uh, the wrestling. I truly <laughs> feel that way. Um, the first woman to call a full episode of Raw to call WrestleMania, an all around great human, Renee Pack. Pack hit Pack. it! Hit it! A cat? A cat. A net pop cat. We should, have, we should like call Maurice and have her say it. That's, what it sounds <laughs> That's that. literally what I was about to say is I <laughs> feel that Maurice is the only person who could do your last name justice. Uh, Kevin Owens and, and Sami Zayn as well could obviously follow through on that as well. Yeah. But some, I mean, obviously coming out from Maurice's mouth is the best way because she's exceptional. Not that those she, guys aren't, but Maurice everything she says. Maurice. Everything she says just sounds like like you need to have a fun sundress or a real cool button up. And you're always holding a small cup of like coffee or espresso. Yes. 
as uh, everything she says when talking to her feels like I'm just a peasant. She is a very chic person. And like, it, yeah, I, I feel like a peasant around her too. You can't <laughs> underdress around Maurice. You have to have a great outfit. You have to like really be trying. This is yes. not a no effort kind of hang because she's just always on point. Always. And she's always on. She's yes. always on. I yeah. feel like there's never a time. But but I think that's why her and uh, as I call him Mike, because I just want I always tell him we all Kofi and I would ride with him. and We'd say, OK, turn Miz off. Just give me Mike. Oh, God, yeah. This is Mike. This is Mike. It's I don't know what you want. To figure out who Mike was. Because I was the same way. When I first met Mike, I was like, oh my God, this guy is at 11 all the time. Yes. And then we were um we were doing tough enough together and we would ride from the TV hotel to the performance center, like around there where we were filming tough enough, and we would drive together. And it was during those morning drives on like little sleep that I was like, oh, there he is. There is Mike when he's quiet and just texting and scrolling to see what cool things people said about him on Twitter. That's Mike. But then it turns quickly into Miz when he responds or when someone does say something cool on Twitter. You guys see this? Oh my God. You see the cool move I did last night? We get it. Okay. I always make fun of him too. Cause like when we were, when we were doing that drive together, we went through the Starbucks drive through and the way he was like ordering from the person I'm like, dude, Turn the mic or turn the Miz off. We, you, the people are not getting that through the speakerphone into no. the car. It is not translating properly. Like they never, think you're being a dick, never. but you're not yes. being Mike. You're so being you. you. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean? This is me. This is me all the time. She thinks That's it's funny. Awesome. She's in on it. She gets it. I'm like, okay. Which they're not. They never are. <laughs> At 3.30 in the morning. The sweet, innocent lady behind the hotel room check-in desk is not in on your shit. She doesn't man. want your bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, getting right into it, we need to talk about something. Okay. You did a music video with Tom Green? Yeah. I, I feel like we've known each other for a while, and yep. we've been buddies. I didn't know about this, and then I found out. I, so you started with with wanting to get into acting and then improv, which I knew nothing about, but it makes complete sense. Now, looking back on the stand up show we did with the Zigman, yes. it makes complete sense. But yes. the Tom Green thing, let, let's hear about it. That that's that oh. was one of the most interesting things I read up on. It is one of those like I feel like I wave that flag every now and then. But, okay, so I've done a few music videos. I did the Tom Green music video. Kelly Clarkson one to stand out the most. Yeah, the Kelly Clarkson one. But then there was, like, some other random ones for, like, different, like, Canadian performers, stuff like that. Like, a country music video. Every every Weezer video? Pretty much. Yeah, it's funny. I remember when um, the Weezer video came out for, um, oh, fuck, what song is it? Anyways, Alicia Cuthbert is in the music video. And I remember people thought that we looked similar yeah. in that music video. And I was like, oh, I'll take that. Alicia Cuthbert. Dylan Postle's first movie crush. She's amazing. Dylan amazing Postle's fan. first movie crush right she's, there. She's really cool. She's, I hung out with her, I mean, years and years and years ago, but she is, she's a cool chick. Yeah. You want to like throw down some beers with her and like shoot the yes. shit. She's pretty yes. rad. Yes, hundred percent. But yeah, so I did the Tom Green music video. Um, so because I had been doing a couple music videos at that point, like I, you know, I was auditioning, I was taking all these acting classes, all that stuff. So I was like in that loop. And the director of that music video called me. He goes, hey, do you want to come down and, and work today and be in the Tom Green music video? I was like, yes, of course. Like trying to put it cool, but I'm like, check the OR. You like it so far. Let's go. <laughs> Please. So I was like so psyched to go. And he was like, he was really great all day. He was super, yeah. super fun. Um, he had like his whole crew of dudes. But yeah, he was really fun. And we like all hung out afterwards. We all went out like, downtown Toronto. It was actually the first time I ate sushi. They had sushi on set. And I remember I was like trying to like act like I know You're about in. the world. Yeah, yeah. And I remember eating it. I was like, fuck this. And You're like, pushing things out, out with a chopstick. Hated it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, I love sushi now. But yeah, the first time I had it was like, Ugh, get that out of here. I hated think that's it. everyone's reaction to sushi yeah. the first time. 
everyone. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're thinking of how do I get through this? What do I know about <laughs> this? Yeah. I remember I went to take a bite and they're like, no, you have to like just take the whole thing at once. Yeah. So you can't like bite into it, it falls apart. So you have like a mouthful of sushi and you're like trying not to gag on it in front of Tom <laughs> Green, who I think had like recently had just had split up from Drew Barrymore at that time. Like it was fairly fresh. Um, so I had a lot of questions. I'm a huge Drew Barrymore fan. So I'm like, oh my God, pray tell. I don't care about Tom Green. Just what tell, give me the yeah, glass on Drew. Yeah. On Drew. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so then you're trying, you're, you're doing the improv and the acting brings you back to Canada and mm-hmm. uh, you hook up with our mutual friend, Jimmy Corderas yeah. and right after wrestling. Um, yes. So I have to ask because this is a, a sit down here, always a wrestling fan. Was this just a, um, a broadcast uh, job that came up? What brought you to that? So it's kind of a combination of both. Like I did watch wrestling growing up. I, you know, like most kids it's like all my I was like such a tomboy so all my like guy friends were like pretending to be Kane and the Undertaker and uh you know the rock stone cold all those guys I was good as Kane because for some reason they were all really obsessed with Kane um (laughs) not not for some reason I mean he's you know he's great but um it could have been ever like all of my friends in our backyard wrestling wanted to be Jeff Hardy stone cold the rock I love I love Kane I don't think (laughs) anyone ever was like Guys, said, gonna be Kane today. My guys love Kane. Maybe they wanted the pyro. I don't know. Maybe they wanted the mask. I'm, I'm not sure where the love of Kane was like deriving from. Because yeah, most guys are like, yeah, give me the stone. Let me be Bret Hart. Like any of those things. They're like, no, no, never Kane. Me Kane. Um, so I did watch wrestling growing up, but then you know, kind of put things on pause. I'm playing a ton of sports. I'm doing, you know, I'm in like high school, all those things. So I wasn't like. My finger was not on the pulse of the wrestling world. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, I started working for the sports network. So my boss at the time, yeah, he was like, oh, we're going to, we want to start doing a post show for Monday Night Raw. We had the mm-hmm. rights to, uh, to WWE in Canada. So I was like, oh, hell yeah. Um, so yeah, and that's when I kind of went back to the drawing board and was like, wait, what's going on? Who's who? What's happening? Um, and that's when I just like, fell in love with that world. And it was really great because I was working with, with Jimmy Corderas. I was working with Arda Ocal, um, guys that obviously, I mean, Jimmy's history within WWE and then Arda's like this massive fan. So they were amazing for me to lean on. Also, Moro Ranallo at the time, he was on he was on one of those yep. rotating chairs as well. Um, and, and he, that guy's like walking Wikipedia for all. He's incredible. Oh Absolutely my God. incredible. Like he brought a life to it that no one had ever seen. Like it, yeah. just just ev- he could read. The f- they say he could read the phone book and yeah. make me like, oh, tell me about Jim Smith and Jane Smith. Yeah. Tell me about them. Yeah. It's, it's he's man he was incredible he's just so he's so talented and so laser focused on those things and like I mean whether he's calling boxing he's calling you know MMA he's calling professional wrestling like just that there's just that infectious um energy that he brings to those calls and he's just he has such like a stamp on his voice you hear it and you're like oh that's Moro yeah got it like what a what a great like signature to be able to have but anyways I mean yeah I was just so lucky at that time to be able to work with guys like that and be under their learning tree as Mm -hmm. I was figuring out the pro wrestling world how do I fit into this world how am I speaking about it all of those things it was a really great way for me to to really step my dip my toe into those waters and not having any clue that I would eventually end up working in WWE and to do all the things that I got to do there. I did not see that on my bingo card. So did you turn off other sports uh, and like the broadcasting of other ventures and just focus on WWE and professional wrestling? Or was it like, Hey, I'm doing WWE and the, the right after wrestling as well as hockey and this and I was this. doing everything so at that time so I would do we did like the right after wrestling show which became aftermath we did that on Mondays and Tuesdays I yep. believe is what we did because Smackdown was taped on Tuesdays um and then I was also doing a daily show called live at the score where I covered all yep. sports so we were on for like I want to say like three hours, something like that, just kind of covering whatever was going on. We would toss into baseball. We would give some golf updates. We would even get into like horse racing and shit, like stuff that I'm like, how did I do that? When I look back on that, I'm like, how did I get thrown into that mix 
and is just so just blindly f- like okay yeah is that a kind of a fake it so you yes. make it kind of thing 100 percent. okay 100 so percent. you're essentially making the news that sports news uh, entertaining in your own way so that people think you give a shit about the kentucky derby yeah and it's like putting like i'm a big research person like i prepare for everything because like i feel like like if I'm going to be talking about something, I need to watch yeah. everything because I hate the idea. Like I, it gives me anxiety to imagine like the red light being on the camera and me being like, mm, didn't watch that. Not a clue what I'm talking about. So being in that world and not, you know, not necessarily being a huge NBA person mm-hmm. or huge MLB person and trying to find ways to, to talk about those things. But again, I mean, I give a huge credit to like the, the guys that I was surrounded with at the time that I could lean on. They really just let me be me. They, they walked me through certain things. I mean, there was definitely some moments like, you know, you have some, some hiccup moments of like, yeah. Oh God, what am I doing? What am I saying? But I was so young at that point in my career too. I was only like 23, 24 when I started doing like that national broadcast show. Um, so yeah, definitely like learning on the job as I was going, but it, it was so much fun. We just, that's all I remember from that is like, we had so much fun. They just let us do kind of whatever we wanted to do and really figured out what my broadcast voice was because they just let us be us. That's, that's, you have the fun and the good group around you. And so it's not work. Literally yeah. it's, it's said all the time. Like as long as you enjoy the group around you, it makes it worth showing up every day. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Shout so out. then the transition to does WWE reach out? Do you reach out to them? How does that transition happen? Cause so it WWE was like, it seemed immediate, like pretty <laughs> immediate to me where it was like, Oh, she's doing right after wrestling and and working with Jimmy and Arda. Oh, she's on television. Yeah. This is crazy. Did it feel like that to you too? Or was kind it? Of. Yeah. Okay. So like I didn't really know what I was going to be doing. So as I was wrapping up at the score, um, their their contract was being like somebody else was buying over that network. All these things were happening there. My contract is coming to an end. And I knew that I wanted to come work in the US. So I was like, I would literally take like my weekends. I would fly to LA, I'd fly to New York. I'd be taking meetings with different production companies and different networks and blah, 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 like hustling. Um, so I wasn't sure where I was going to land or what was going to happen, but um, yeah, I had gone, uh, I had gone to like ESPN and had an audition there on like the Monday or Tuesday or something. And then by Friday, WWE was like, oh, we want to fly you down to Stanford and we want to bring you in for an audition here. So I went to do that. I don't think I did a great job on the audition. Like I was like, oh fuck. Cause they, you know how it is there, but they, it wasn't like a traditional audition lo and fucking behold right it was like no no yeah. of course Shocking. it wasn't a regular yeah. audition yeah they had me do every single job from like i did commentary i i hosted a show like right after wrestling um i was doing interviews like i did a little bit of everything they had me there like all day some things i was good at some things i was maybe not so good yeah. at um but yeah anyway so i got the job i i moved down to to new york i was living in queens uh, which was great um, but even like, <laughs> the first like year of me working with WWE, I wasn't on the road. So I was doing no, okay. studio shows Just for studio, a while. Yeah. I was working with Mean Gene again. That's what That was my, my next bad. thing is I need to hear how that relationship just, um, was it an immediate, immediate. I, man, he, I wasn't around him uh, a dozen times. But it seemed like the second or third time I was around him, it was like, he's known me and I've known him. And he's like this crazy uncle to me that I love going to his house because he's just going to be sipping hard coffees and and that kind of thing. Oh. Well, I'm just clicking through the channels. That's like how I always saw Mean Gene. And him and I always had this fun relationship, which I noticed he had with every single person he was around. Yeah. And then I'd see you two together. And it was like, did they know each other from the score or like, <laughs> how did this happen? So what's funny is, so when they brought me in and again, WWE hired me and I was like, I don't even know what they hired me for. Like, cool. I'm glad okay. that I'm like a part, I'm, I'm in the fold, but I have no idea what the end game and is. And they didn't tell you. 
No, I don't think they knew. Again, lo and fucking behold. But they're like, cool, you come here, we'll figure it out. So we did, obviously, it worked out. But um, yeah, so they brought me in and the first thing was going into work on WWE Vintage. So we carried that show at the score. So that already set the bar high because this show only broadcast in Canada. It broadcast, I think, in like India and England. It was not broadcast in the United States. Okay. Um, so I knew coming in that I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be on the show that I have shot wraparounds for in a studio for the last like two, three years with this man. Now this yeah. mean Gene Okerlund, like you want to put a human being on a pedestal. That's the guy, especially um, in like, especially in wrestling history, but in your part of wrestling history, yeah. that is the guy there doesn't get any bigger than him it doesn't and so i remember like walking onto the set and it was like this like rickety studio that's gotten much better over the years uh but it's him and i and he he like welcomes me onto the set for the first time and i like walk on i hit my mark and i remember being like nervous like kind of shaking a little bit even of like oh my god this is happening what this man is like a superstar and i'm like my dumb ass comes cartwheeling on um but he was just so great like we got to work together for so many years um even when I was on the road with WWE like you know working raw working smackdown pay-per-views all that then I moved across the country to Las Vegas where John and I were living for years and I would still once a month fly on like a red eye to Stanford do that show we would shoot like six seven episodes in like a chunk and you imagine Mm -hmm. shooting that many episodes with like an elderly man yes that's what i was gonna say how sharp he stayed was all the time literally he again we talked about you know mike always being on gene was on pulled back a little bit but he's so sharp and so yes he knew everything from when he started to current day he had he had the the stats and the gossip on that it was incredible he was pretty much like what you would imagine and hope that like Santa Claus is like was yes. like seen with like a harder edge that like to throw back some cocktails yeah. and like talk a little <laughs> shit. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, he that's a, that's the exact description of yeah. me. every uh, a 364 day Santa Claus. Yeah, where, yeah. Uh, the, Santa gets that one day. Mean Gene gets every other he day was like, because that's he was like Santa Claus. It would like raid the mini bar and like, <laughs> like <some great> stories. <laughs> Did he ask you for your mini bar on any occasion? No. I feel like I can hear the call, <laughs> Renee. I I they didn't stock my bar. It seems <laughs> it just and suddenly he doesn't have any whiskey or vodka in his mini bar. Him and I, we would, we would, after almost every show, we would yes. go get dinner and drinks together almost every time. Um, and God, I just cherished those moments so much. Like the whole crew, we would go out, we would go yeah. to like the Capitol grill. That was, you know, one of the only great spots in Connecticut, not in Connecticut in Stanford to eat. Um, so we would go there a lot of the times and just like stuff our faces, bring the cocktails. We kept it coming, but even just like, at the hotel bar, like we would just have the best time. Just we the talk, best. We talked about it on when I when I did oral sessions. Is you, you were you were a hotel bar staple, and it made me feel so good <laughs> because I loved the after TV hotel bar. Is anything was, better than that? Nothing. nothing shitty chicken, shitty chicken tenders, and, yes. and cold fries. Yes. Uh, sometimes nachos, but they're going to be awful. But as just the cocktails, as long as they'll stay open and just seeing people trickle in yeah. as they're getting done, the Cole and JBL, the, oh, here's the camera coup. Oh, here's the, oh, yeah. a couple magic guys. It yeah. was just, it was almost like a, the, the, whenever the gates would open, there'd be someone and it was like, cheers or oh, which, which one's this? Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. I do love that. Like that as much as like, I love what I get to do for a living. I love my job that I got to have. Like I love doing those things, but I also just like really fucking love the bullshit afterwards. I love when like no one's working and we're all just hanging out and we can all just like enjoy each other. I love that. Checking into the hotel the night before was the worst because you always were like, Oh, 
I can't go tonight. I have to wait 24 hours till <laughs> yeah. I can go. But that's going to be my spot. Yeah, and I'll that's see you gonna... later. <laughs> <laughs> Literally like a, a date, but yeah. you know what's coming. Yeah. yeah 100%. Oh my God. It's the best. That's I awesome. do. I miss that. Yeah. Those were, those were always good, good times. Those are good bonding experiences. You can shoot the shit at like the venue during the day, but it's not the same. You're always, the you're always, you're always, and you're like, yeah, just talking some shit. Because suddenly no one's watching at that point, yeah. even though everyone's still at that <laughs> yeah. hotel, anyways. Literally, even though everyone's watching and everyone's there across the street at the yeah. arena. Oh no, I'm under the microscope at the hotel bar where all the office is and everyone and fans mind you yes yeah 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 suddenly i'm off and this is okay i know yeah yeah i put a dumb ruse right and we're well, <laughs> all under that guy's like the harry potter cloak was on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because because it's the hyatt regency bar that's, that's exactly why exclusive over here guys yeah Got my um, points then it's a again a very quick transition to backstage interviews on TV, mm -hmm. literally on the show each and every week. But I'm going like, to blow past that because it seems like that didn't last long. Again, to me, your career, in my mind, is the score, Monday Night Raw. And like, <laughs> literally, I see, because it was such a, and it probably didn't feel like that, but to me, it was such an awesomely fast transition it, it just, it, and it's such a fitting role for you like that. Everything fit, everything fit. And it was like, every role was made for you and you knocked everyone out of the park, but then, so how does the transition to commentary? Because that's a completely different world. Again, you yeah. didn't know what you were getting hired for, or then yeah. they didn't shocking, but how does that come up? Is it just, Hey, we need someone. Kind of. So I think I think that they always maybe intended to have a woman on commentary or thought we should try that. Let's get another voice in there. You know, they're always looking for that new perspective. How can we freshen this up? Make it sound that was before different. that was before everything. And, and, and pardon me on this. Everything was inclusive, though. That was like way ahead of its time to have it, it kind of in it. I do think that it was in it. So? like the women's okay. evolution had already started. So yeah. it depends on which side you look at it from. I do feel like when I was hired though, that was like the transition was all starting to happen. Okay. I don't think it was like as on the nose yeah. at that point, but I think the wheels were all in motion for okay. those things to happen. Like Charlotte was there, Becky was there, yeah. Paige was there, like all of those women that were going on, Bailey, Sasha, all those women, Alexa, they were all there getting ready to like go do their shit. And then I was there as well, trying to figure out what I was doing. So I had started out doing NXT commentary yep. and that was early on. Um, and that was a really, I enjoyed that. I liked yep. being able to work with William Regal. If you know, that's just a different environment down there. It's less under the microscope. You can definitely get away with a little bit more. Um, I like that. I did like doing that, but it was never like my end goal to be a commentator. But when that when the option comes up to me, they're oh, like, hey, do you okay. want to try this? I'm like, yeah, fuck, why not? I'm here. Yeah. Let's give it a whirl. Like if someone's going to do it, I would love for it to be me. Um, so yeah, I started doing it at NXT. I was calling some superstars, maybe a little main event on the, on the road. Um, and then that stopped for years. It was done. That was not just the backstage. Uh, yeah, just backstage panels. Um, I was still doing some studio shows, yep. some wraparound shows, all that stuff. Um, because you know, that's what that's what I'm good at. That's what I like to do. But then years go by and they're like, maybe let's revisit this again. And Hunter and Michael Cole came up to me and they were like, Hey, um, coach is gonna be out in two weeks or a week or whatever. Um, he's not gonna be here. We want you to fill in for him. I was like, okay. Great. And at this point, I really wasn't feeling the pressure because I was like, well, I already did it. And like, I don't know, I, the bar was low for me, I think. In terms really? Of, like, that, just, that's surprising. I, was, like, I didn't think that it was going to be a thing that they were going to like really pull the trigger on. So I was like, oh, so you, you thought it was going to be a fill in. Yeah. Yes. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll fill in. Sure. Why not? Let's give that a try. So went to do that. And I do feel like that was very much so like finished the show. Everyone was really happy. Everyone's like high-fiving. That was great. We all loved it. 
Uh, Vince even tweeted out about it. Like when you get the Vince tweet, that's a big deal. I was like, oh, I, I oh, got oh. what I always say after the WLC match was the only time I ever got the Vince stand standing and clapping. And yeah. I was like, I fucking got it. did. I got Done. it. I don't yeah. have to do anything else. Yeah. It, that's it's how not I the usual know. finger call yeah. over. Oh it's, God, it's are not, they like yeah. not looking at all? Oh. Yes. Yep. Uh, when you worst. go over to him, when you go over to him <clears throat> to ask him how it went, and he's just busy looking oh. at his phone and looking at the screen, and it's I like, just dredged up so much anxiety that I've not felt yeah. in a long time. I just like yes. dropped into one of those moments of you're like, okay, so and you don't waiting, want to come here now? Okay, great. Waiting for him and then not wanting to be like, but then everyone's saying that I need to talk to Vince, and it's uh, like, how do I talk to him? Sweating. He's literally he's sweating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's terrifying. Anyways, but yeah, I, um, it was great. I loved doing that. I loved being able to fill in. Everything was awesome. Then it was, uh, okay, you're coming back. I don't know if I did it another time after that, before they brought me back as like the permanent, uh, yeah. like uh, color commentator, one of three of us. Uh, but um, yeah, I just, I wasn't sure what the deal was. So anyways, I got back into it and I was enjoying it to a degree because it did feel at first like, okay, you just go out and you be you and you do what you got to do. But then it, and then it started to not be that. And that's when I started to get in my own head. I was okay. really doubting myself. I how, just, how long was that transition? Like how, when did it kick in? Like, I don't know about this. It was very long. Oh, um, I, I think it kind of happened pretty quick. Um, just trying to figure out like, what is my voice? on commentary what am i yeah. contributing to this broadcast because a lot of times it felt like cool and graves were a two-man booth and they didn't need a third so everything i added just felt like this fluffy bullshit that i was like fuck how can i get in there and insert myself to make what i'm saying feel more meaningful or say things in the right time yep. all that and it's like Again, like I had not done it for years. And even when I was doing it before, it felt like it was for a pretty small amount of time. So again, learning on the job as I'm doing it and nothing like learning commentary on Monday Night Raw, hotbed situation, like, holy fuck. Live, Uh, live, live live. with two, especially Michael Cole, who's just incredible at what he does. And Graves, so good at what he does. Um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely like rough waters for me of like, I, I often always felt very confident in my work and I always felt very proud of my work. And I felt like a lot of times I would, the show would be over and I'm like, Oh fuck. Thank God. Like, yeah, I just, I always just felt really stressed out. Like it wasn't just wasn't fun for me in yourself and your work or about, um, people and what they would think about it kind of all of it like I think I was really in my own head like I really felt like I felt like as soon as the show was over and we walked back through gorilla I was like oh my god no one wants to even make eye contact with me like does everyone think that was fucking horrible and like I don't know how much of that was true or how much of that was just in my head yeah Um, because I think I was so like what am I doing like I had like major imposter syndrome of like okay do I belong out here (laughs) and you know what that like i think everyone's gonna take that that is incredibly shocking to me because you come off so confident and so just relaxed every time you did commentary you come off so relaxed and you're just having fun and you're telling stories and you're just explaining it from not a textbook perspective it's not the hey Sasha does this because Charlotte does this because Miz. you're just having fun. And it comes off so relaxed that that really blows me away. Is that how (laughs) how the the pressure It's like that duck with the feet under the water, like trying to like, you know, remain calm. That's yes, that's exactly it. You're, you're treading water, but you're, you're showing to everyone else that you're enjoying it, but then you go under the water and it's, Oh God. What am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. There were, I mean, don't get me wrong. There was definitely times that like I did enjoy it and we were having fun. Like there was for sure those moments that like me, Graves and Cole were like, we just felt like we were in a good groove and we were all on the same page. Cause like they're really good friends of mine. Like this yeah. was not just like a, 
oh, I'm, I, you know, I'm plugged in with these two other dudes, but like, we are legitimately like very close friends. So yeah. that felt like right off the bat, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I get to work with these guys that I fucking love. This is going to be awesome. Um, but then, yeah, I just like, I just felt stressed out the whole time. <laughs> it was just so <laughs> which, which going back to the score and that is a complete opposite uh, feeling yeah. of not relaxed, not just showing up uh, to have fun. That's a hindrance on the job in itself. And that makes showing up and enjoying it almost impossible. Yeah. That, that's, that's the hard part with that. Especially when you start to like doubt yourself. And I've never felt that like self doubt in my career like that before, where I was like, what am I doing again? Am I good at this? Wow. What is going on? Like, I really like, I definitely had like a bit of like an identity crisis while doing that, trying to figure out what is going on. Something. While trying to be a people pleaser too. I am yes. sure a people pleaser. So I want, I'm like that like golden retriever. I want you to pat me on the head, scratch yeah. my back and tell me that like, we're all You're good doing girl. Okay. You did You're a good doing job. great. Here's your we, but, fucking toy. We all want that. That's, yes. And especially in that world, when we know there is a certain golden retriever owner that... <laughs> Some a lot of times won't scratch backs and yeah, won't give yeah. the belly rubs. I know, and I'd like walk up like, <laughs> yeah, well, like, like you're talking. <laughs> the and he's, reading the, he's reading the newspaper, and you yes. just don't want you don't want to get hit on the nose with that oh, newspaper. Totally. But you're oh, just he's totally. it's it's so crazy to think yeah. that this is a company that's been around forever. But everyone I feel feels that way from this yeah. level to on top. Of that course. you have to appease no one else but one. Yes. And that's crazy. I don't, I it's unlike any other career. I, I, I truly feel that, you know, you go to work at Target, you're not appeasing one person. That's mm -hmm. it's 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 so no, weird. It, it it's really is weird. It like it's such a it is such a weird thing because and it's it's a really weird juxtaposition as well, because as much as you can go, well. This is his sandbox and we've got to make sure that he's happy with everything. He's it's his show. We're just, you know, we're here to make it as good as we can. But then there's the other side too, where like, we can't help, but look on our phones and like, well, what do the fans think? What do the fans want? And you get caught in this, like, okay, well, I know like, this is the thing that you guys want, but like, he doesn't care about, like, he wants this other thing. Like it can be, um, it can just be and like really confusing. Not being able to control or give them what they want necessarily yeah. because yeah. of this that's the hard part is you mm -hmm. have this this feedback from social media which is the worst thing and everyone oh says God. it and it's it's the most cliche thing to say but not being able to go like okay guys next week i'm gonna do exactly what you want you can't do that you just cannot not do that like that Tom yeah Cruise isn't going to play another role in a movie just because the fans didn't like him in that role the first time totally. like it's just not gonna happen yeah it does not work that way so nice to like have those conversations but it's also it can be such a mind fuck too because yeah. i think just like your instinct to want to be that golden retriever and you're like what do they want what do they think do people like this like you can't help but like want to read those things and you just want to do a good job you That's want people exactly to tell you it. that you've done a good job and when you're not getting that it's like oh fuck. yeah it's almost better to to have zero responses yes. than the negative ones yes. which is horrible because you, you should no. like all interaction is great interaction they say but it's it's not it but really is it? Is it's it? not <laughs> it's not i think that i think over the years we've all realized like maybe we should cut some of that stuff out yes but we don't because we need to see we need to see what Kevin Hart is doing on Instagram yeah. and what this person is selling me. It's the best oh it's the best worst thing in the world. Uh, oh, I know. Speaking of the best, talking smack. Yeah. We need to get into this. Uh how that had to have been, you talked about the stress and all of this. That had to have been such a stress reliever and yeah. just the most fun part of the day ever. It was, I love doing, I love doing that show. And that was one of those things too, like looking back and I'm like, I actually don't even know what the timeline was that Brian and I were doing Talking Smack. Uh, I don't think it was for very long, but what we did- It seems do, like forever. Like, it like really fucking great. Like yes. I loved it. I, it really was like, that was one of those things when we started doing that show that I was like, oh, this is what I do. 
This is what I do. This is what I'm good at. This is what I like to do. Um, Because that was, especially for the first, you know, couple weeks at least, it was just, it was me, Brian, and Mike Mansuri for the most part putting that show together. So we were kind of flying under the radar. We were getting away with a ton of shit. Like, it was the show that I think we all wanted to do to just be like, can we just like do the thing that we want to talk about and be our show? Can we hang out at the hotel bar (laughs) Yeah, on camera? Yes. Like no scripts. You don't have to hit this line. You don't really have to hit this time. Like not having any of those restrictions and you can just like be people that love wrestling and talk about wrestling. Like that was really, that felt like lightning in a bottle to me in terms of just like what that energy was. And I think it was a thing that like fans really loved because they're like, oh, we're seeing a different side of you guys right now. And there's something really special about that. It's not, it was one of those things where people tuned in to see real humans. It Mm -hmm. wasn't in front of a crowd and even though it was part of WWE and the WWE world, it was a different feeling. Same yeah, as people drop their characters for a second yeah. too. And it was like, Oh, what? I, like watching I like think that's, reels or something. I think that's because it was you. I truly feel that way. <laughs> I really, really do because you had it in talking smack unfiltered. You had it. It mm-hmm. was just the way you conduct interviews. I'm going to say, I've watched so many of yours where the the oral sessions and that where it's like, I need to do that. I need to do interviews where it's just two pals hanging out and not da 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 Yeah. Because people open up and people, if they wanted to see that same song and dance, they would click on something else. And, sure. and you bring out such a relaxation in people and such a just hanging out with the pals. Uh, I can't spell before each. (laughs) But unfiltered too. Unfiltered was so much fun. And that was so much. It was a different show. It was a different take on a interview with a wrestler, with a WWE superstar. Well, kind of like what you were saying, even like when we first started doing this, I don't even know if we were rolling on that when you were saying it, but um, just having conversations with friends and like, even, yeah, like you go back to like a second ago and we're just saying like, oh my God, my favorite thing is like, when we all just get to shoot the shit in the hotel bar. Like that's a thing that I truly love. And that's what I find that I like to do when I'm having these, when I'm doing these interviews as well Is like, I just like talking to these people. So I think it's that. I think it's like, no one ever thinks I'm like trying to get a fucking scoop or I'm trying to get them to say something that they didn't mean to say. Like that's, it's, 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 we're just bullshitting and hanging out. And I think everyone's like, cool. All of these interviews nowadays over Zoom feel like how to me like when you work for microsoft how their friday happy hours over zoom during pandemic would have been like just a bunch of people looking at a screen acting like they're together hanging out and that's what all these that's what all these interviews should be i feel it should be just hanging out over a zoom call yes 100 percent. and it's funny because i like i don't know like it's definitely not something that i like actively think about or that I've been like oh cool I've like honed my craft in such a way that that's what it turns into it's really not that so I I I usually get a little bit confused if people like ask for like advice on how to like do interviews I'm like I don't fucking know like that's like just well like I just that it's I don't want to say like an imposter syndrome again, but it's like, I don't think I've like really whittled away at this craft and like done this great thing. I'm just like, I don't know. I just kind of like, this is just a thing that I do. And there's not, not that there's not thought and intent behind it. There is. And I do prepare and I do do research and whatnot, but I don't like, I don't know. I I just don't overthink it. Otherwise it's reading a script and it's, it's just reading things to get them in and not conversing with someone that's a lot of that's times the biggest I end difference. an interview and I'm like oh fuck I meant to talk to them about this yeah. thing that I actually we never hit on that yeah we didn't yep. get to it because we were bullshitting about something else it happened yeah. to me like 95 yeah. percent. yeah exactly like, shit how did I let that one go dummy one of the coolest things to me about your career because I am a fan of them uh you got an action figure I have I to turn I have to, I have to include action figures into this Otherwise, I would the majors. I have a feeling would try to kick me off their podcast <laughs> or their like live shows. They wouldn't book me anymore. But so, 
an action figure. Yeah. Never, I can, that had to have been a, never even a bucket list thing. No, it didn't even, never thought it. an option. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never I'm gonna, I'm gonna slam thought dunk. about it. That, that's, that's me saying, you know what, and someday I'm going to slam dunk. Is yeah. in your mind, like, uh, not even, that's not a thing. Not a thing. Again, like, you think back to like me going into like Stanford and I'm like, do, 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 doing my audition, not a clue what the fuck's going on to like, wait, I got an action figure out yeah. that happened. Uh, that was really cool. I do have like a massive regret with it though. Okay. Um, I fucking hate the outfit that my <laughs> figures wear. I hate it. You, you heard it here first. Let's, uh, okay. That's. <laughs> Tell me. So again, dummy that's never been scanned for an action figure before. I went in and I, like I was wearing this like long pencil skirt, which is like a pretty tight, long skirt. Those don't scan well. I should have been wearing pants or something. So now I'm in this like dorky skirt and these like boots that don't match it with like a crop top. Like it is just not an outfit that I would. <laughs> it's like a nude colored skirt. <laughs> It's it's really it's like a weird tan. It does yes. not <laughs> like that. Like that's not what I wore for the scan. That's what they improvised for me because they're like, I guess it's kind of close to what she's wearing, which like it was. But uh, yeah, I mean, no no shade, no shade. No. But I just I wish that I wore something else. Yeah. For this, or if I was just like, can we just like throw on these other pants or like, come on, something else, a different dress. That's oh, that's incredible. That that is a take that no one else would have no because that, that especially because it's your only one it's like yeah even, i know it's my only one deal. yeah yeah <laughs> not like i like okay well the first one i didn't love the outfit so now i know when i get scanned again i'll put on yep. this this and this and i'm like oh and she's just immortalized in this fucking nude <laughs> in the nude in the nude skirt <laughs> i know right. exactly the skirt it is to this fucking lace number from top shop it hasn't been thrown out yet because of no, that it's, it's long gone it's i just gone. i know i i wore it a bunch and i loved it but not good for us then that figure came out i was like no yes. that's going yeah, away it's burn not... it. <laughs> Kill all me. right uh SummerSlam 2020 would be your last uh show mm -hmm. with wwe um time to go you did something that not a lot of people do. You left on your own, yeah. which is awesome. It's absolutely awesome and so respectable and, and all of that. You just, it was it just a, hey, you've talked about interviews where it was, I, I've done it all. And I truly, like, it, th that's an amazing mindset to have. Is that, was it, was it a, a bit of a time coming? Um, I don't know. Like, it's hard for me to say, like, especially as I can like reflect on it differently now, like coming up on two years away from, yeah. from being there. I think it was a lot of things. I think it was, yes, I have done it all. I've, I've done all of the things and now I'm not quite sure where I fit. I've done all the things like, do I just kind of sit and spin my wheels and wait for whatever that next thing is going to be? And, you know, there's, there are, you know, WWE is a million different shows, but, you know, backstage had come to an end. I finished doing commentary. So once I was done with that, was like, well, what do I, I just go back to doing interviews? Do I go back to doing panels? It all kind of felt like a bit of a step backwards. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, it just didn't feel like it fit right. As much as like, I loved doing those things and I, I, I don't look at those jobs as like lesser than um, I definitely don't like, I, I loved doing those things, but it just felt like, okay, so I've already done those things. I've been doing them for a long time. Do I just go back to continuing to do those doing the studio show with Fox came to an end that felt like that was a really great opportunity. And that being in that studio environment and doing a show that felt big and felt yeah. really cool and important. I loved that. Um, and I felt like doing that. I was like, oh, I belong doing this. Like, I feel really comfortable. And that was like a really good, like, I kind of needed that after doing the commentary thing and feeling like, oh, fuck, what's going mm -hmm. on? It was yep. nice to be back <laughs> in my wheelhouse. I'm like, okay, I'm good at this. I know what I'm doing here. Um, and then COVID hits and things had really changed. And it, I, I've used this like reference before talking about this, but it felt like the ride had slowed down enough that I could jump off of it. Um, cause okay. you, know, you know how it goes where it's like, oh my God. Okay. So SummerSlam's coming up, but then we're building to 
to WrestleMania or to Survivor Series, whatever. Like there's all of these other things that are constantly happening. There's another show that we're going to start doing another show. So you've got to be ready to go shoot something in Stanford or we're doing this in New York and blah, 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 blah. There's just never a time to go like, do I still want to keep doing this or should I go try to find something else to do? So once COVID had happened and all those other uh, pieces played their part, I think I could see the Ferris wheel kind of slowing down. And I was like, I'm going to take this opportunity to jump off this ride right now because yep. I see the opening and I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. Before it gets too crazy again. And yeah. you're almost, you're almost pulled in yes. too deep once again. It's like the year, a, a year goes <clears throat> by there and what feels like three months. Yes. Like it's, it's, it's crazy. It's never, like, stopping. Yeah. never stopping. Yeah. Never stopping. Time just flies by there and you, you, you know, you get in it's a, it's not just, it's like an insular world, but like, you know, we, it, it is like our own little bubble that we yep. live in and it's awesome. But yeah, I was like, I just, I think I kind of want to go and spread my wings and see what else I want to do. Find something else that uh, kind of scratches that itch. Well, you found many scratches or itches or whatever they are. Uh, the biggest itch, your mom, which mm-hmm. is the coolest itch ever. Big uh, itch. It's yes. a real big itch. It's a yeah. huge itch. Yeah. Um, I have it on here. On um, whenever I have uh, a parent on, I think especially a newer parent to an extent. What is so? So being a parent, as we know, is the best thing ever, the craziest thing, the most life changing thing. What is the one thing that your daughter has like not changed your life with, but like you went oh man, I can't do this. Or, hey, oh man, I have to do this. Was there a single moment where it's like, oh shit, I'm a mom? Yeah, I think it's like that reminder to like slow down and be a person. Don't be, don't become your iPhone. Don't become your Android. Because a lot of times, like I get up in the morning, I get up with her, we're down, I give her her breakfast, I'm making my coffee. And that's when I'm like, oh, what email do I need to get back to? Do I have to post about this thing? Like work-related things. But to her, it's like, oh, no, 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 I need you right here. And she, this was actually not long ago. And she was like, she screamed at me. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, of course. I can't put you on pause because I have to like deal with these emails and deal with these like work things that I need to get to. So it's really that like slowing down and like taking that, like, even if it's, you know, 10 minutes where we can just like sit and I'm with her and I'm on the ground with her and I'm on her level and I'm doing the things she wants to do. I think that is like, that's parenting. It's being able to press pause for a sec and like be there with your kid. See that age. I remember nothing of just because I was gone. Like I was yeah, gone right. so much at that age with WWE yeah. at the time. Yeah. And it's like, I, I don't, I, I don't ha- like, I remember being home for those things. But it's like, I was so go, go, go. Exactly what you said. Yeah. The, the first things I really remember is like when he was three or four and like doing things. Yeah. Really doing shit. Yeah. And, it's, and then exactly like you said, there has to be a moment where you shut down work and mm-hmm. all of that and just be like, hey, what are you doing? And yeah. it's it's at this age that Landon is now at 12 going on 18. It's. <laughs> even more having to shut off and see what he's doing yeah. because he's at that age of go, go, go. It's That's nice awesome. because I think we all need that yep. regardless if you have a kid or not. So it's nice to have the kid that's like, um, excuse me, put your phone down, put your laptop down, like unplug for a second and just like, just be present, just be a person, just be yep. a mom, learn about your kid feed them new things, try to teach yep. them new things. Like it's, it is just the best. I said it on a recent uh, podcast. I, I feel like parenting should be about stepping back and thinking, how do we make this memorable? Going to the yes. zoo, yes. just a trip to the zoo or a park. How do we make this memorable? I took Landon to MGK and Avril Lavigne, his mm, first ever fun. concert a couple of weeks ago. And one. I was like, how do I make this as memorable as possible for his first ever concert? And we just had a blast. Like it was yeah. such a cool day. And I was like, he's enjoying this. He loves MGK. I love Avril and MGK. This is the coolest. Yeah. So. Oh, I, it's actually funny. So for, um, uh, for the 4th of July, our house has like a, a rooftop patio and we've got yeah. this 
beautiful view of the city. So we could see all the fireworks, but Nora goes to bed at like 6.30, 7 o'clock. Yep. She was sound asleep. But when the fireworks kept going off, she woke up and she was like, I opened up her curtains. Her room faces out yeah. on the city. She's got the best room in the house. Um, and she of was course. like, I didn't know recognize the fireworks. She's only a year. So I was like, I don't know if she's yeah. going to know or care. But anyways, we ended up bringing her out on the balcony and we just sat and we both, both of us were like, oh, fuck, I wish we had our phones. We get a picture of this. But it was actually really nice to not. just have the memory in our yes. mind because yes. she was just like so enthralled. She was like yeah. sitting on John's lap. The fireworks are lighting up her face and she's like pointing to them all like, oh, my God, like yep. it was happening. And it was just one of those like cool moments that I like. I know John and I will always remember that. She obviously won't. But it was a memory for us that was like it was just nice to be in that moment. And mind I, photos it. literally yeah. photos that go on forever up here exactly that no one else and, and, and in all reality you'd get the twitter hearts or you'd get your the it's, oh that's cute from your parents or family totally but that doesn't that doesn't matter it doesn't matter it it's, doesn't matter it and then you're like busy the trying to like you're not even enjoying the moments you're like no oh, like, can you like look over this way let me try and like make the photo look and you're not enjoying like, it you're not exactly. enjoying it at all you're literally exactly. not watching the fireworks because you're worried about taking a picture totally that's that's the biggest thing that i just learned is who gives a shit about totally you have the mind photos and the mind memories that's yeah. exactly it that's, mind photos i like yes. that it's true take that little like mental click yeah well the the last thing i want to chat about is a another project this cookbook yeah i got this came out of left field to me <laughs> Out of left field. I was like, oh, uh, I know Renee from her awesome work with WWE and being a pal and the hotel, the Hyatt Regency bars and this. <laughs> and she cooks like this. Where did this come from? Is this been a passion all your life uh, that you just decided, hey, to pull the trigger now? What what made this happen? So I just love cookbooks. I love okay. to cook, but I also just love cookbooks. I own so many cookbooks. I'm like a sucker for them. There's something just like so pleasing to me to just be able yeah. to open up a cookbook, read through the recipes, look at the beautiful photos, feel the nice paper that they're printed on, like all of those things. So I'm I'm a cookbook fan. I obviously love to cook as well. I think about cooking all the time. Um, and it was it was, that was like a bucket list thing for me where I was like, really I do that. And so often we get like put in these like boxes of like, oh, you talk sports, you talk wrestling, that's who you are. And it's like, no, no, I have other layers to me. And there's other things that I want to do. I don't want to just yeah. be that one thing. So the fact that I was able to like put a book like that out, and I'm like so proud of that book. I, I had so much fun writing in it and it felt I was Renee Young for so long. That was my first thing that I like really released as Renee Paquette. Oh, man. And it I felt yeah. like that. Like I could talk like myself again. There's like some curse words in there. Yeah. There's like some inappropriate shit in there. And just stuff that you wouldn't really anticipate in a cookbook. And also like, it was just this like brainchild of mine. Of like, I want to do a cookbook and I want it to be fun. I want like my personality to pop off the pages, but I also want to infuse some of like my love of music in there. Just so you. I, yeah. I put like the QR codes in there, of, like mm -hmm. some playlists that I put together. Like it just felt like a very all encompassing Renee book. That's exactly how, when I put my book out, I finally, exactly what you said, where I get to be me yeah. and I get to like, almost like a weird self therapy, like yes. hey, get it all out and yeah. just be me and let people see that I don't live under a ring and wear green all the time yes. and sometimes wrestle a midget bull. I don't do that on my day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> like that's not my life. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. It was like, it was so cool to just like, I had not written anything in a long time yeah. either. So it was really nice to like reconnect with that side of me. Yeah. And I, it's funny because I think people that have like read the people, you know, you look at a cookbook, you kind of just look at the pictures and flip through but people that have like actually read it. They're like, oh, you're like personality is really in here. Yeah. And I'm so used to writing for myself. If I've used a teleprompter that I can make my writing sound like somebody is talking. So I think that's a good like transfer. Yeah. Skill that, that works. That's a completely different, different way to write too. Yeah, that's exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun though. I, I love that book. You brought it up. 
real quick about being able to cuss and about saying what you want in the in the book. I have to literally a random question that just did you ever drop a cuss on commentary? Never. Never? Oh, no, I call I I said like dick doesn't count. I called Graves a dick at one. Like, I, okay. One. Yep. I called him a dick. Um did you get the, I the said voice in douche. your douche? I don't think did, that you no, said I douche? I called I called Baron Corbin a douche on commentary. Douche is yeah. way worse than dick, I feel like in this day and age. Yeah, I guess it is. But no, <laughs> I never said anything to me. Like Vince did not get in my ear about either of those. Because I remember, like when I said, I call when I called Graves a dick, and I remember he like looked down the table and like, oh, <laughs> hello. Uh, and, yeah, same thing when I dropped the douche line. But yeah, nobody ever said anything. It was it was that's cute, awesome. You know? That's yeah. that's awesome. I, I'm good uh, at like finding the curse words, and I'm like, I don't think I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but people will know that there's like a different intent behind it. But again, Michael Cole and Corey aren't using those terms, which I right. again go back to the beginning of the interview where I was like, talk, like, you just come off personable. That's a different voice on commentary. It's just, again, running into you on the street. Hey, how do you feel about Asuka and Becky? Da 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 da. This guy's a dick. Perfect. But I also like, I kind of think that that's another reason why it didn't really work because. I don't think, and like Graves is so great. Pat McAfee is so great. Like there's people that have made that work. I find me being personable is not a thing that works on commentary because it's hard hitting and things are very serious and uh, you have to like make those stakes really high. And not that I can't do that, but I think it wasn't, I don't know. I think people like more of like the me just shooting the shit with them and you can't, it's hard to do that in sound bites. Okay. I I that can understand sense. that. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, yeah. That's it. I mean, that's it. Dude, we, this we was went a lot through, of fun. We went through the Tom Green music video. We hit on the cookbook. We went talked about Unfiltered and Talking Smack, our love of hotel bars. Uh, <laughs> you got millions of projects. What do you want to plug? What are we What are we checking out about Renee Perkett? Perkett. Um, honestly, right now my main focus is just doing the sessions. Um, it's I've really kind of cut back on some things to just really center my focus. And I think I was like putting too much shit on my plate at one point that I was like, "What am I doing right now?" So it was nice to kind of pair those things back and just focus on that show right now. So that's really been like the main thing I've been doing. I mean, I've got some other like back burner projects of some, some wheels that are spinning in in the ether. Um, But yeah, right now it's the podcast. So Tuesdays and Thursdays, the sessions drops. Um, There's all the stuff on the YouTube as well. I think kind of expanding that as well, like finding other content to put out there. That's not just the show. It's not just clips from the show. Maybe doing some video diaries. As video diaries, as not vlogging. Yeah. Not vlogging. Vlogs. It's not a vlog. Fuck it's a video diary. Like fucking <laughs> Exactly. We're not thirteen-year-old children recording yeah. and vlogging. No, we're video diary. Video like, diary. Like like Ashanti on MTV <laughs> back in '98. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> so awesome. great i love it well, thank it. you thank you for coming to hang out once again uh i appreciate it it's yeah, always good to see you me on. this was a lot of fun awesome. fact. guys let me talk to you about our friends over at manscaped bringing you the absolute best in men's below the waist grooming manscaped makes precision engineered tools for your family jewels the performance package is the ultimate bundle in men's hygiene Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for our listeners. 20% off and free shipping worldwide when you use promo code SWOGGLE at manscaped.com. That's promo code SWOGGLE at manscaped.com for 20% off your order and free shipping. Wait, if my math is correct, 7 million men carry the two that's 14 million balls all right there it is guys thank you thank you for checking out the interview again that was very early small talk so uh if you haven't heard it yet thanks for checking it out now thank you very much and uh 
yeah, hopefully you got some insight on the life, the career, just how everything has went down in uh, Renee Paquette's life. And just a fun journey that she's been on from calling sports in Canada to WWE to AEW and everything in between. And then cooking. I really, that, that's another thing that she has just built another kind of franchise, built another brand with her cooking stuff. Hell yes. She's, she's killing it. She's killing it. Um, but yeah, man, that's it. This, this, it. That was a hell of an episode. Hell of a week. Interview. Good bag. It was good for me to go back and re-listen to that. Uh, it, it's just a fun trip down memory lane. Who knew that when you started doing those small talks that we would be here now doing this podcast and uh, that would just be part of the, 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 the catalog of the podcast now. It's, it's awesome. Um, it's but- uh, listening back to those interviews, A, because my, my setup wasn't, I mean, my setup has gone through a lot of changes. A lot of changes, thanks to George and Matt Stein and everyone's help, aka telling me what to buy and how to set it up. Uh, but yeah, it's only going to get better. The camera is getting replaced. I'm done with Zoom going forward. Yes, we're we're, we're upgrading. We're upgrading the system while still using a Mac. That's the downside. <laughs> uh, but- guys thank you so very very much make sure again check out our friends at roosevelt's roosevelt's.com rsvlts.com use promo code swaggle save yourself some cash also we have a couple unboxings coming up to the channel very very yes, soon we do Landon and i uh we unboxed the aew commentary set we unboxed the dog collar match the Ringside exclusive blood and guts dog collar with CM Punk and MJF. A really, really awesome set that Landon has not put down since unboxing it. And uh, we have a couple more coming down the pike. Down, down, down the pike. Okay. <laughs> I, never, I never will get used to that. But <laughs> again, George, plug your stuff. So, full transparency, we already finished recording the episode, but. I learned a bit of information of what Dylan was doing prior to recording this podcast and the people need to know because it's, it's, it's insane. Uh, Dylan, please (laughs) tell the people this amazing story. My tummy really hurts. I'm not one to shy away from a bet. As we know, I am not one to shy away. And I, a couple weeks ago, I told David C. Anderson, friend of the pod, Josh Weimer, friend of the pod and Chris Bogger, that I, <laughs> I told him that uh, I prefer saltines over Ritz. Ritz are great, oh, but yeah. I definitely prefer a saltine over a Ritz. Yeah. And then I said, I could definitely eat a whole sleeve of saltines. That's a lot. I didn't realize how many it was. Do you know what the number count is? 40. That's a lot of like you. I feel like the average person can eat a lot of saltines. I don't so, know if necessarily the average person can eat forty saltines. In I a don't single think sitting. the text fully came through to his data before David C proceeded to go. Nope, nope, nope. Let's go. Let's try it. Like it was an immediate response of nope. You're doing it. Let's go. And then I was like, okay, how much time do I got? Like he goes 10 minutes and I didn't realize like I didn't, as we know, I don't think about things. I just do them. So I go, okay. And then Weimer goes, yeah, but no liquid. And I go, oh, that's easy. And then I guess there's a study out there that says you can't do more than four minute without liquid. Well, so the actual challenge itself, according to Wikipedia, this is an actual challenge. Is that these, these a holes stole it off Wikipedia? It's it's a it was like a, a widely known like thing. It was like that. Remember when everyone was eating the spoonfuls of cinnamon? It was like that. Well, yeah. Oh, it was like one of those things where like people would do it, it like, on. Oh, you on, know why? You know why? It was on TikTok. I'm 37 years old. I don't need TikTok. 
Well, so the original challenge is the saltine challenge is a food challenge or competition in which a person has 60 seconds to eat six saltine crackers without drinking anything. So it's six crackers. Yeah, six in a minute. So I did it. Yeah. And my tummy really hurts now. Again, full transparency. This is end of the episode. But I don't. I, I made know. it. I made it. So land and I was on face. I they wanted to FaceTime. I said, "You guys are just gonna watch me eat for ten minutes." And then so landed. I recorded a thing where Landon set the timer and all that because he wouldn't lie to for me. He wants to see me fail on things like this. Because also David C bet fifty dollars hairs on this, Ooh. and I said I don't care about the money or the upset stomach. I care about the pride. He wants the glory. I wanted the glory. <laughs> I didn't get the glory. Final count. I think you swallowed. Did, <laughs> also, I feel I will say this. I will say this. Kobayashi, the the hot dog eater. Yeah. It counts however many are in his mouth. Am I right? I am not well versed in the art of competitive eating, to be completely honest with you. I'm pretty sure it counts however many are in his mouth. So, 32 swallowed, we'll say. No. I, st- I can't believe. This is, this is up real there deep. with the conversation was of how so many deviled eggs myself. you can eat. Like, this is up there with that. With what? The, the eggs? The deviled eggs. Like, oh, that's, that's happening on the 4th of July. But just, okay, for the people who are not in the know, in a single sitting, Dylan, how many deviled eggs do you think that you can eat? 40. 40. Easily, not that ten minutes. I'm saying, like, you give me a half hour, eggs. a half hour, I could easily eat forty deviled eggs. I just don't know anybody. Maybe an hour, really half hour is too much. Twenty hour. eggs. <laughs> it's yeah, but they're is... deli- they're not. You don't bite them. Literally, you just <sighs> done. You're oh, hold on. So now you're telling me not only could you eat 40 deviled eggs. I'm not swallowing the thing whole. I was just going to say you're swallowing them whole. No. When I eat a deviled egg, I take the half and I just pop it in the mouth. But here's the thing. I failed at the, the competition and I'm not happy with myself. But are we are we going to I can't go round 2. I no, can't. But are I, we going to do like a right weird now, food challenge episode? My stomach right now, it doesn't hurt as much as when I did the one chip, but it hurts. I, I really and the reason do... is it's like a, like a rock. Like when, when time comes, oh, yeah. when time oh, yeah. comes, That's, you got a solid mass of, of, of wheat and salt. Yeah. Yeah. This is them two and my son on FaceTime, Weimer and DCA, because Bogger's fake working. Weimer and DCA are just, just tormenting me and with drinks they're just sipping on their mountain dews and their starries first off get starry out of here i'm already sick of it already sick of it but landon is drinking powerade right next to me i can't drink a god dang thing but 32 i can't believe i made it through that many uh if we're going by hot dog eating challenge rules i got all of them in my mouth that should count as a win but I'm not going to asterisk this win, this loss. Not going to do it. We are also, we haven't talked about this on the pod. Pimentos? How about this, guys? 37 years old. I just found out olives, green olives, the little red thing isn't part of the olive. Nope. Pimento. I texted... I texted my father and George this. <laughs> I, I'm glad to know that I'm on the same level of Eric Posta. This was pretty knowledge. late at night. This was like 9.30 p.m. It's part of the job, man. Part of the job. Yeah, part of raising me. <laughs> Takes a village. Because uh, I saw these pits come out of olives and I was very confused. <sighs> Pimento. Fantastic. All right. Well, back to the normal closing. I'm not going to just plug my stuff. We got to remind everybody at Going Postal Pod on all forms of social media at Dylan Postal 
on all forms of social media. YouTube.com slash Dylan Postle. Twitch.tv slash Dylan Postle. SwaggleAuction.com. Get yourself a free $10 credit over at whatnot. DylanPostle.com. ProWrestlingTees.com slash Swaggle. And for me, uh, I host another podcast it's called the Game Marks Podcast. That podcast is hosted by myself and former Create a Pro Champion, Johnny Clash. But on this podcast, Dylan likes to call him what? <laughs> That's it. And uh, we break down a different wrestling video game each and every week. And we would love if you would come and check us out. We are available on all forms of social media at Game Marks Pod. And with that, Dylan, another episode in the bag. Great episode. Great interview. Huge thanks again to Renee Paquette for coming on the pod. And now the people are waiting for your signature sign off right before that lovely end music, Dylan. So whenever. <laughs> Hey guys, Magic Candle Company is the best way to bring your favorite vacation scents to your home. The smell of a tropical beach, dark water ride, a cruise ship, or even a water park. The Magic Candle Company is the best way to bring those nostalgic and iconic scents from your favorite vacation spot to your home. Visit magiccandlecompany.com and use code SWAGGLE to save 15% on your whole order and bring the magic home today.